thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone in Toronto. It's still good morning here on the West Coast, uh, so wherever you are, uh, I hope your day's off to a good start and uh, I'm very grateful for you to sign on for uh, a second kick at the can uh, of economics. Uh, I see our turnout is great uh, again today and I'm just uh, really gratified and really thankful that there's so many people who are willing to take uh, part of a precious Friday and uh, go and listen to The Economist. Uh, sort of sounds a bit, I think, sometimes like a, a Stephen King novel or something like that. Just when you thought it was safe to get on with your Friday, along came The Economist. Uh, but uh, we will try to make it as uh, entertaining and interesting and accessible uh, as possible. That's why we're teaching this course. That's why we believe in uh, popular economics education, uh, rather than uh, focusing on the charts and graphs and uh, tech qualities uh, of it all, like uh, happens all too often. So uh, thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, I also want to say a special thanks to the technical team at Innes College and uh, uh, Later Life Learning that have been uh, producing the shows and uh, handling all the technology. Um, I, I want to recognize their labor. We learned last week that uh, work, that four-letter word, is what makes the economy goes around. And uh, the work of that technical team is uh, first rate. It's a privilege uh, for a presenter to know that uh, all those details, including the music. I love that music, eh? Uh, somebody put some thought uh, into the music that uh, goes along with the uh, uh, the intermissions and the, and the waiting room uh, and all that. Um, we should talk, though, um, I think it's, it is, uh, Lisa, with your team about some of the economic content of the music. Because that Bare Naked Lady song you were playing earlier, that if I had a million dollars, I'd buy you a house. I don't know where they think they're buying that house. It's not Toronto or Vancouver for that matter. So we'll work on some of the uh, economic content uh, of, the, of the music. Uh, okay, so our uh, second session uh, today is going to be uh, a look at a little bit of history, a little bit of economic history. Um, and I think this is uh, uh, this is appropriate and uh, and uh, interesting, and uh, I dare say um, counter hegemonic or even subversive. Uh, to look at uh, economic history. Usually, uh, economists come on TV and they're trying to predict the future, right? That's what uh, that's what economists uh, are usually asked. What's going to happen to GDP? What's going to happen to the stock market? What's going to happen to unemployment? And uh, they, they're asked to make their forecasts, and they don't usually do it very well. Uh, in fact, they say uh, economists were put on the earth to make yeah. astrologers look good. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, this predictions of the future business uh, doesn't always work out too well for uh, economists, but uh, the uh, looking back at history is something that we don't do very often, and I think we should do more of. Uh, so that's why we've dedicated our second session to looking at uh, history of the economy, uh, that is how the economy evolved over time and how it's changed, and also the history of economics. Uh, the history of economic thought and how economists have tried to understand the economy uh, over that whole period. And I, I think this is important because uh, when you study history, you realize that uh, nothing is static, nothing is permanent, and there's nothing about our economy that is set in stone. Uh, and I think that's very important because uh, typically when economics is taught, it's taught as if it's physics, uh, you know, charts and graphs and supply and demand and economic formula that seem to be, uh, uh, first of all, uh, true in some kind of objective sense, and secondly, permanent. Uh, but our, our economy uh, cannot be described that way, and our economy is certainly not permanent. And by studying history, we learn that it isn't uh, permanent. I was fortunate to uh, the very first economics class I ever took at the University of Calgary in 1979. Uh, I had a professor, you, you had a choice. You could either take um, economics 201 and 203, that was microeconomics and macroeconomics uh, as your first year courses. And anyone who studied uh, at college or university knows how, how boring that can be. Or you could take an alternative, a full year course called Economics 206. And uh, the professor, his name was Robert Wright, uh, was a very open-minded guy. And he taught, you know, he wasn't like a, he wasn't, you know, a revolutionary or anything, but he taught economics uh, through a historical lens. And I've actually still got the book this is the first uh, economics book I studied in 1979 at the University of Calgary. It's called The Age of the Economist by Daniel Fussfeld. I have to show you the spine because the cover has fallen off. Uh, it's gotten so much use over the years. Um, it completely turned me on to the subject because of the history of it and the debates and the changes and the conflicts and the controversies. 
uh, that made economics interesting. Whereas if I had gone into that normal 201, 203 micro macro pairing, as so many people do, I suspect I would have gone into sociology or philosophy uh, for my major instead of economics. Uh, and God knows the world needs another unemployed left-wing philosopher. Uh, instead, uh, I'm an employed left-wing economist. So uh, there we go. So that's just a, a little bit of uh, introduction. I'm going to call up the uh, the slides now, and we'll get uh, going through the um, uh, our little lecture on uh, on a history, a little bit of history uh, of uh, the economy and the history of economics. And uh, the readings, uh, as you know, in the uh, recommended uh, textbook, not compulsory, but recommended, um, which is Economics for Everyone, uh, will be uh, following along with the material that's in chapters three and four uh, of the textbook uh, this week. So the economy is always changing. Uh, the economy is not static. It's not permanent. It's not uh, set in stone. Uh, it changes in all dimensions. It changes in terms of what we are producing, what are the goods and services uh, that we produce with our brains and our brawn. Uh, as we discussed last week, it's the driving source uh, of the economy is our, our, our productive human effort. And what we do with it uh, changes. How we produce those goods and services also changes uh, in terms of our ability to learn over time uh, better ways of uh, producing things. Usually that involves uh, using uh, more and better tools uh, to produce the goods and services uh, that we uh, want to uh, produce through the economy. Uh, what also changes uh, in the economy is our relationships to other people. We stressed that the economy is a, um, a, a social enterprise, if you like. Uh, we are always working in various ways uh, with other people uh, in the economy. And the nature of those relationships and who's calling the shots and what sort of input we have and what sort of uh, power we have to influence uh, all of those decisions uh, is uh, also changing uh, over time. Uh, and those, um, uh, those ongoing um, uh, changes and evolution uh, in the economy, what we produce, how we produce it, and how we work together um, means that it's, it's very important uh, to study economic uh, history. Uh, it gives us uh, some perspective. It helps us to understand that the way things are today are not the way they have always been, and they're not the way they're always going to be. Um, and in that regard, I think that um, empowers us to develop a perspective, our own perspective, our own values-based perspective uh, on the economy, what it is, what's good about it, what's bad about it, and uh, how it can change. Um, because uh, there's nothing permanent or natural uh, about uh, the way the economy works uh, today. Uh, the economy has been changing constantly and economics uh, changes constantly as well. And this is, uh, as I mentioned, what I think makes it a fascinating uh, subject. Uh, right alongside the changes that we see in the economy, including the changes in social relationships, uh, economic theories have advanced and evolved over time and often pushed and prodded by the debates and conflicts and problems uh, that we see in the real world economy and in our society. Uh, economists don't live in a vacuum. Uh, I, I think many of them are too uh, removed from the day-to-day -day conditions of the economy, but they still have to recognize what's going on and what's going on in society and adapt their theories and debates uh, accordingly. And we can see how the development of economic thought has uh, paralleled uh, the changes in the economy uh, that happened. So, um, I, if anyone, if anyone in the audience has uh, studied, actually studied history, you're you're in for a, a surprise here because I'm going to take the whole of human history and uh, economic history and boil it down into about five minutes here. It's a it's an enormous disservice uh, to the historians who uh, carefully uh, compile uh, evidence and analyze it and uh, develop narratives about how uh, society uh, changed and how history unfolded. Uh, this is a very, very short uh, and, and compact and obviously oversimplified uh, description of how the economy has changed in the entire uh, history of uh, human beings, going back 200,000 years or so, roughly, uh, to when the, 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 the modern humans, as we know them, um, descended from the trees in East Africa somewhere and, uh, and then started to spread around the world. Uh, we always had an economy. OK, remember, if we define the economy broadly as the sum total of the work that we do to produce the goods and services that we need to, to stay alive, to survive and thrive, have a good life. OK, we've been doing that all along. We've had to. We've had to work uh, in order to survive. Uh, but again, the way we work and how we organize that work uh, has changed uh, over time. 
So uh, for the majority of human history, probably uh, the, the first 90 percent of it, uh, we've had a situation where uh, you had uh, uh, human uh, communities that lived very close uh, to the land, uh, what we might call hunter-gatherer or subsistence societies. They were working. Their work involved um, uh, interacting with the natural environment to gather what they could uh, from it, to harvest what they could from it in the way of food, of course. So that includes uh, harvesting um, uh, plants and berries and so on that they found in their environment and hunting as well. So uh, uh, hunting animals, um, using those materials for food, obviously, and then eventually uh, also using uh, uh, all of the natural resources that they could access, including um, wood, uh, trees, uh, rocks, uh, minerals, um, uh, to uh, provide the necessities of life and um, support their uh, community. Uh, and this was, in a way, a, a uh, obviously a very uh, low technology uh, society. They they used uh, tools. They did use tools, but they were very simple tools based on um, uh, manipulating sticks and rocks and uh, and so on that they gathered. Um, but it was a way to survive. And uh, eventually, they improved uh, the way that they uh, gathered um, uh, these resources from the natural environment and uh, processed them and, and developed. Um, indigenous knowledge over time about how those uh, how those resources uh, could be harvested and uh, used and um, add value added to them through the work that uh, those societies did. A uh, couple of interesting uh, features about hunter-gatherer societies, they lived right on the land and by and large uh, just produced as much as was required to survive. Um, and we'll discuss this concept, but we'll introduce it right now. Uh, there was not what we would call an economic surplus. Uh, in the sense that the society produced uh, what was required in order to uh, maintain themselves. Uh, obviously, sometimes even that uh, was impossible. It was a very, uh, in a way, uh, rugged existence. Uh, and there were times where it was literally a fight for survival and, and humans, human communities didn't always win it. Um, so uh, there was uh, efforts to produce enough goods and services to survive and maintain the community, but not much else. So there was no surplus over and above uh, what was required to keep the society going. And in part, as a result of that, the social structure of these um, uh, subsistence or hunter-gatherer societies was very flat, very simple. There were not uh, great distinctions, at least economic distinctions, uh, in terms of uh, who did what. Everyone in the community had to do uh, some work. Everyone in the community had to participate in the hunting and gathering activity and help keep the community uh, alive. Um, and it's not to say that there weren't distinctions. You could have had chiefs or uh, religious leaders or priests or uh, others within the group who had, you know, exercised certain authority within a clan. Uh, but um, in economic terms, um, it was a very flat social structure. Everybody uh, worked to produce enough goods and services uh, to keep the economy going, to keep the society alive. And that was about it. And we still have seen, even in modern times, uh, some examples of hunter-gatherer societies, even until a few decades ago in Canada uh, and other places around the world, who are still living uh, in a kind of a subsistence fashion uh, like this and have um, gathered tremendous uh, information and knowledge uh, over, uh, over their generations about how to do that and how to do it su successfully and uh, sustainably. So the idea here is not to suggest that these are uh, primitive societies. It was the first kind of economy that uh, society had, and uh, it worked in the sense that people stayed alive and communities could uh, thrive and expand. Um, and in some ways, it was uh, smart. There's evidence to suggest that uh, some of subsistence societies actually had more leisure time than we do uh, in the sense that uh, they could time the work that they did with the uh, fluctuations of seasons and uh, animal migrations and so on, get the work done that they needed to survive, and the rest of the time they had actually a potentially more leisure time. Uh, so uh, there were advantages and disadvantages of this mode, uh, but uh, that was the economy for most of, uh, most of human existence. Eventually, uh, human beings learned how to um, be more efficient and more productive in those relationships with the natural environment. And uh, one innovation or uh, invention that uh, proved to be particularly important was the uh, onset of permanent agriculture. Uh, instead of um, uh, migrating and uh, wandering, uh, looking for the food that they could harvest, uh, the plant uh, life that they could harvest, 
uh, human beings learned that you could uh, use horticulture, um, uh, plant a particular uh, um, species, uh, cultivate them. And in fact, you could also uh, genetically modify those uh, species over time so that they were more appropriate, more productive and more edible. Um, so with the growth of permanent agriculture, uh, we found that uh, human labor could produce a lot more food than uh, just wandering the countryside uh, looking for it. And uh, this led to all kinds of uh, changes. Uh, same went for uh, animal husbandry uh, in terms of domesticating different animals and again, breeding them over time so that they were more useful and productive for humans. Uh, this allowed people to produce more, the people doing the work allowed them to produce more with their labor than they needed to just survive. And so this was the first time that we saw the um, evolution or the emergence of an economic surplus in the sense that um, uh, people could do the work, keep themselves alive, and there would be something left over, uh, which uh, in, uh, creates an interesting question. If there's stuff left over, that creates the possibility that there's some people who can live without working uh, because the people who are working are producing more than enough for them to stay alive. And so the surplus is there uh, in a way uh, waiting to be taken by someone. And uh, this is when you saw the emergence of more um, obvious and um, uh, distinctive uh, divisions between different groups within society, in particular between those who uh, worked to uh, produce the, the goods and services, and then another group, uh, generally a small group, uh, which didn't have to work, but uh, had somehow through uh, brute force or inheritance uh, or some other um, path uh, had established a position of leadership that allowed them to um, live off of the surplus without actually having to work uh, for it. Now, uh, the slave-based uh, system, uh, eventually uh, you had uh, some kind of uh, elite, whether it was a monarchy or a royalty or a pharaoh, um, calling the shots, uh, living off the surplus uh, of others who produced it, and making decisions about what is done with the surplus, whether that's building pyramids or launching wars uh, against uh, nearby societies uh, or whatever. Uh, and um, uh, that had advantages for the pharaohs, but it wasn't necessarily the most stable and efficient way to kind of control the uh, labor that was done by uh, all the people who were actually producing the stuff. Um, slaves uh, have a tendency to revolt uh, from time to time. They're obviously not very happy with their situation. Uh, they may not be working with the maximum uh, uh, sort of positive effort in their jobs, as you can imagine. Uh, cracking a whip uh, on their backs is a certain motivation, but may not be the most uh, successful and flexible motivation. And eventually over time, uh, we saw the evolution of a more nuanced kind of subtle form of class struggle uh, in the form of the feudal societies that we saw in Europe in the Middle Ages and also uh, in other parts of the world, including China, India, Japan, uh, even uh, parts of um, uh, indigenous, uh, more, more developed indigenous societies in uh, Latin America showed uh, some features of feudal structure, where again, there was a group of people generally through inheritance, the sort of landed gentry who had a certain privileged position, uh, they didn't have to work. It was still uh, uh, the majority who were doing the work in the form of um, uh, growing uh, growing food. And then the landlords uh, would come around uh, once a year and collect uh, the surplus uh, quite directly um, that the peasants did. They'd leave the peasants enough, more or less, to live on, uh, take the excess, take it back to their castle, and then use the surplus to uh, uh, fund all kinds of other things, including people doing non-agricultural work, like uh, craftspeople, entertainers, um, and soldiers, and um, and found other things to spend the surplus on, um, including you know trying to expand their own uh, share of their own their own territory, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it was a slightly different arrangement. It was uh, supposedly a kind of mutual system of rights and obligations. The landlords were supposed to protect the peasantry against marauders from other territory and. Uh, allow the peasants to hunt in the common forest and so on and so forth, but the peasants still were doing the work and the peasants had a big chunk of their output just taken from them and often didn't have enough to live on. So uh, moreover, the peasants from time to time revolted too. Uh, the unfairness and um, unjustness and intoler intolerableness of this arrangement uh, obviously motivated lots of uh, conflict. And from time to time, uh, that uh, system was challenged and the landlords ended up uh, putting down the peasant revolts and reasserting their power through uh, through brute force. This system as well uh, proved that it wasn't necessarily the most flexible in terms of motivating 
people, the people to do the work and maintaining the class structure. And eventually, uh, starting around 200 years ago or a little bit more, uh, we saw the evolution of a new way of organizing work, uh, which uh, we have come to call uh, capitalism. Uh, and this was uh, in response to all kinds of things, including technological changes, um, the, the in early manufacturing and industrialization uh, allowed a dramatic increase in productivity and produced a much larger surplus. And that meant there was, uh, in a way, more proceeds for an upper class that wasn't doing the actual work um, to appropriate and uh, to decide what to do with. Um, so this is a, a very, very uh, condensed and simple uh, telling of economic history, 200,000 years of economic history that I'll summarize in this uh, very clever, highly technical illustration uh, that comes from the, the book. Uh, and uh, what was changing, what we were producing was changing, how we were producing it was changing, the tools and technologies that we were able to use, and how we related to each other while we work was changing uh, as well. In fact, they all tend to uh, go together. Um, now, from the Hunting Gathering Society, which was a very, uh, in a way, um, simple and flat social structure where everybody worked to help the clan survive, from that point on, uh, you'll see that there's a, a, a commonality uh, in the organization of these societies in the sense that there's somebody doing the work, and then there's another group that isn't working but somehow living off what the other the, the workers are actually uh, producing. In other words, that issue of the surplus and who controls it. Uh, and this is uh, a common feature of those uh, subsequent societies. The other point to make is that uh, that process of evolution um, obviously is going to continue. Um, I don't know what is going to come after our current society. I have my own views on what I think should happen, but uh, you know, I have no idea how society is going to unfold, how technology is going to unfold, um, uh, how uh, things like uh, the environmental pressures on our economy are going to change how we work and how we relate to each other. But I can say with 100% certainty, the economy that we live in today is not going to be here forever. Um, we are going to experience fundamental changes in, um, uh, in what we produce, how we produce it, and importantly, how we relate to each other. And Anybody who thinks that uh, this is the natural permanent state of affairs and we will teach it in an economics textbook because that's how it will always be, uh, is just trying to pull, uh, pull the wool over your eyes. Um, I've uh, focused a lot on this issue of the economic uh, surplus. Uh, every economy, if it's going to keep going, has to keep its uh, workers alive and uh, do the other basic things that are required to allow production to continue the next year. Uh, so that means at least uh, a subsistence a standard of living for the people doing the work and um, replacing the wear and tear uh, that is experienced on our tools and our machinery uh, and putting aside the other things that we need to start production again the next year. So in an agricultural setting, um, and every farmer knows you can't just eat everything that you produce. You have to save uh, the seeds for next year's crop. So uh, that at that point, you've got enough to uh, have everybody do the work again the next year. Um, above and beyond that uh, is what we've defined as the surplus. That is to say, you're, you're doing more than is required just to keep where you're at. Um, and that opens up questions about what are you going to do with it and who's going to determine what you do with it. And there's lots of different options for how to use the economic surplus. You can consume it directly so that you have a standard of living much higher than just uh, subsistence, much higher than just being alive. You can invest it in the sense of putting it back into the economy so that the economy itself can grow and be even more productive next year. Uh, or you could just waste it. And we've seen lots of ways that that happens. Uh, the pharaohs building pyramids. Uh, or, uh, you know, I, I went to Dubai once and looked at all those ridiculously tall skyscrapers that are clearly vanity projects and think that's a modern pyramid. That is absolutely just wasting surplus uh, to create something that uh, we don't actually need and isn't actually uh, useful. And we can see lots of examples of that uh, around our society uh, as well. Um, and how the surplus is managed and controlled and what it's used for is a key, uh, a key issue, a key feature of our economy. And understanding that uh, is, uh, is key to helping us understand uh, the economy. So uh, the themes from this uh, quick, uh, uh, ridiculously compressed tour of economic history, in every case, right back to the hunter-gatherer societies, it's human work that drives the economy. Uh, the economy doesn't exist without productive human effort, our brains and our brawn. And I said that uh, last week, I'm going to say it this week, and I'm going to say it every week for the rest of this course. 
because it's so uh, essential. Whatever the economy is, however it's organized, it's human productive labor uh, that makes things happen. Uh, moreover, humans are pretty smart and we learn as we work. Uh, we think about ways to do it better, uh, how to work more efficiently, how to produce other things. Uh, we try something out, uh, we tweak it so that it works even better and uh, away we go. So this learning by doing issue is uh, part of uh, a kind of inherent capacity uh, that seems to be hardwired into our brains. Uh, and it helps to explain how we develop this uh, incredibly productive and innovative economy uh, over time. The term technology is often misused in economics. It doesn't mean, you know, the awesome uh, machinery that you've got there. Technology literally means uh, knowing how to do stuff. And that human knowledge about how to produce things and produce them better that accumulates over time is a, a key source of our economic uh, progress. Uh, the other thing that changes as we go are the social relationships between human beings and how we organize our work and how we manage technology and what we do with it. Uh, I've talked about this issue of the surplus. Every society which produces a surplus, and that has been the case uh, uh, from the slave-based uh, systems and permanent agriculture on, uh, has to decide who gets it, who controls it, and uh, what they do with it. Uh, and uh, again, the core takeaway here, nothing in the economy is uh, permanent. Uh, and this is important for us to just think about um, how our society works today. It drives me uh, it drives me bananas when I hear somebody say it's just a natural thing that people are greedy and you just have to uh, uh, harness that greed and accept that greed. If you try to do something different, you're violating human nature or you're violating uh, economic laws. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. Everything, including how we behave as human beings, uh, changes over time. And, um, and will continue to change. And anyone who tries to say this is the way it is, uh, don't bother trying to change it, is um, trying to disempower you from expressing your own values and your own ideas about how it uh, should change. Uh, I think there's a song, you know, about that. That's just the way it is. And I'm not going to try and sing it. I'm going to leave music up to the technical team at, uh, Ace, at uh, Innes College to put the music on. Uh, okay, so let's talk about where we ended up in that whole historical tour, which is the economy we live in today, uh, which is known as uh, capitalism. Uh, as we mentioned, every economy is driven by human work. How we organize that work changes over time. And we have one particular form, particular and in some ways peculiar way of organizing work and making those economic decisions. Uh, and it is an economy that we call uh, capitalism. Uh, funny thing, if you go and study economics at a regular university uh, in uh, in Canada, uh, you probably may you, you may go through an entire university degree in economics without ever hearing the word capitalism. Uh, they don't like to use that term. They don't like to name it. In fact, some people argue it's a slur uh, to call it uh, capitalism. Uh, instead, they just uh, call it the economy um, or have other euphemisms that, that we'll talk about or or just pretend that it's just a natural and permanent state of affairs. And uh, for the reasons uh, discussed, uh, that's wrong. Uh, it is important to take our economy and understand it uh, in a particular uh, uh, historical context, uh, understand it as the result of 200,000 years of economic evolution. And uh, by the way, that process of evolution isn't going to stop. So even citing the word capitalism makes you sound like a dangerous radical uh, of some kind, like one of those old fashioned Bolsheviks who, you know, who's got a round black bomb with a fuse on it uh, and uh, a red beret and a beard. Um, but, uh, you know, whether you like it or hate it, uh, whether you celebrate it or want to change it, you might as well call it what it is. Um, what makes our economy uh, capitalist? There's two defining features, two key defining features. Uh, the first is that most production is initiated and undertaken by private companies. Most of the human work that goes into producing the goods and services we need to survive and thrive is produced by private businesses who are doing it for profit. Uh, not all. In Canada's case, it's about 85% of our GDP is produced in what's called the business sector, which means private businesses doing it uh, for profit. About 15% of the goods and services produced in our economy is done differently through either government agencies and public services or nonprofit and community agencies. Um, but most of the economy is uh, production for profit. The other defining feature of our economy is that most of the work that's done, at least in the formal economy, the formal mon for money economy, uh, is a particular kind of work, a particular kind of work that we call employment. 
Uh, that's where you're doing the work for someone else. They tell you what to do. They own the value that you add to the product that you're working on. And uh, in return, you get paid something, some kind of a wage or, or salary or payment or commission of some sort uh, to motivate and compensate you for the work that you've done. So those two features, production for profit and wage labor or employment, uh, are the things that make our economy capitalist and that distinguish our economy from economies that came uh, before it. Now, uh, I mentioned they don't like to use the word uh, capitalism in many cases uh, and instead use some euphemisms in the textbooks if they describe the economy at all, if they, even, if they even admit the possibility that there might be another way of organizing the economy. They usually call it a market economy, and that fits with the uh, kind of main thrust of uh, neoclassical economics as it's taught today, and I'll explain later what that is. Uh, that, that says the economy is driven by uh, market pressure and market forces and supply and demand. Um, market economy is, uh, in a way, um, a, a really misleading term for the economy that we live in. It reflects a kind of ideological perspective uh, in conventional economics that markets are good, markets are efficient, markets get you where you need to be, um, markets are optimal, and that ideological perspective is not justified in real life. Um, it's a matter of historical fact that other economies, including slave-based economies and feudal economies, had markets, extensive markets, where there were things that you went uh, to trade, uh, to buy and sell. Uh, so markets are not unique uh, to capitalism. And many things in capitalism have very little, if anything, to do with markets. Lots of things uh, operate in capitalism more like a dictatorship or more like a central planning organization rather than uh, markets. This is particularly true when you look at what happens inside individual companies. Uh, imagine a company like Walmart or Amazon and the incredible uh, detailed planning and command and control that goes on within those businesses that makes them so uh, efficient in one sense and, and certainly profitable uh, for their owners, right down to deciding what products get put on what shelves in every Walmart store and uh, managing these uh, warehouses that are like sweatshops for Amazon uh, down to every 10 seconds of time for the people working in those warehouses. That's not markets uh, in action. That is central planning in action. I've often thought if the Soviet Union had people who could plan as well as uh, the leaders of Walmart and Amazon, it would probably still exist uh, today. So calling it a market economy is an absolute misnomer, uh, 100%. Uh, we should call it what it is, again, whether we like it uh, or not. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how capitalism uh, came to be. Um, it uh, emerged in the 18th century, uh, 200 and some years ago in Western Europe, uh, particularly in Britain. You uh, had uh, capitalism emerge from uh, some of the more advanced and centralized uh, feudal monarchies. Remember, Europe at that time was not the world leader. There were other places in the world, including China, Japan, India, as I mentioned, that had societies uh, that were as really as productive and advanced, in some ways more advanced than Western Europe. But the features in Western Europe that allowed the uh, um, capitalist uh, arrangement to sort of thrive uh, included uh, uh, that um, you had a big growth in non-agricultural production and trade uh, because agriculture was becoming more productive and that allowed a larger share of society to do things like um, uh, crafts people, uh, simple manufacturers, um, uh, services and other non-agricultural work. Um, eventually you had the development of uh, new technologies, particularly steam power and all the machinery that could be operated with steam power. Uh, and that meant you had, in a way, more complex tools, more expensive uh, and ambitious machinery that had to be owned and operated uh, by someone. Um, and then, as we'd seen through history, you had to have some social evolution to go along with the economic evolution. You had to have new ways of owning and controlling and managing uh, all of those uh, new ways of working uh, and capturing the surplus that was uh, produced them. Uh, there's several reasons why capitalism emerged uh, and why it emerged particularly initially in, in Western Europe. Now, of course, it's a dominant system around uh, the world. Part of it had to do with the, uh, these technological innovations and inventions that I mentioned, including steam power and uh, machinery. Uh, part of it had to do with the centralized nature uh, of uh, feudal society. You had, th um, in not everywhere in Europe, but in some places in Europe, like England and France, you had the development of uh, national level um, 
authority that could create a unified market, transportation, weights and measures that allowed for more uh, trade within that whole area. Um, abundant resources, including uh, for energy, both water, power and coal. Uh, the connection between colonialism and the rise of capitalism uh, cannot be overlooked for sure. Uh, you had the European um, powers that were uh, extracting raw materials, including human labor, of course, through the slave trade uh, from colonies uh, that allowed them to um, uh, expand their uh, production. Um, and it also gave them a very uh, important captive market for the early output uh, of uh, capitalist businesses. So India, for example, was a huge market, a uh, captive market. Uh, they were forced to buy from English manufacturers, and that gave them uh, a good uh, a good head start. Uh, the role of government, uh, this seems ironic because we've come to think of capitalism as free enterprise and private sector leadership, but capitalism wouldn't have started without a strong role for government to oversee how commerce was occurring and protect private property, uh, conquer all those colonies and manage them. And um, we'll study later in the course, this is still true today. Capitalism wouldn't exist today without strong government. And we've learned that again uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, now, capitalism uh, initially was a pretty harsh thing. Uh, you had sweatshops, child labor, um, people uh, suffering really in the cities in Europe as uh, capitalist production expanded. Um, you had very high profits, very uh, dynamic system in a way that, in a sense, that the owners of the system reinvested a lot of uh, a lot of what they harvested in profits, reinvested it in uh, growing uh, the economy further. Um, over time, you saw all kinds of uh, chaos and hardship and conflict, uh, depressions, recessions, wars. Uh, you saw people fighting for basic rights within capitalism, uh, including basic labor rights and including the right to vote. Initially, capitalism was not democratic at all. Uh, even where they had elections, it was just owners of property who could vote in them. Uh, so uh, don't associate the term capitalism with freedom uh, or, uh, or democracy as some try to do. That was never the case, and it only happened because people uh, fought for it over time. Uh, we've seen different phases of capitalism as well. I've argued that the economy is always changing, and that's true of capitalism uh, as well, um, including different eras uh, in, uh, in the history of capitalism. Uh, the Great Depression, of course, in the 1930s, which caused lots of changes in how we uh, manage the economy. Uh, you had a post-war uh, expansion, the, the 50s and 60s and 70s that were very dynamic and very prosperous. And more recently, we've had a sort of harder, harder nosed, tough love version of capitalism that we, uh, we call uh, neoliberalism. Uh, that's a mouthful, neoliberalism, by which we mean the kind of harsher, um, less forgiving, a more unequal um, version of capitalism that uh, has uh, been the dominant version in most uh, of uh, certainly the advanced industrial world uh, over the last generation. A way of thinking of it is capitalism with the, the gloves off. You know, in the olden days, boxing was sort of, you know, a gentlemanly sport there. You just kind of, you know, carried on uh, almost a, a sort of a polite uh, a polite way to uh, have a conflict. And yes, uh, in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was still class conflict uh, in our economy, but it was managed and, and sort of controlled. Uh, nowadays, it's more like a UFC type of a thing, this horrible sport that I can't bear to even watch when it comes on TV. Uh, I guess they, they actually still have gloves in a way, but they it's a no holds barred uh, attack on each other to see who survives. And this is kind of the harder nosed version of capitalism that we live in uh, these days. Um, what we call neoliberalism uh, reflects uh, an effort uh, to try and restore the power of business um, in the economy, but also in politics and even in our culture. Uh, after the uh, post-war golden age of the, of the 1970s, it seemed that the economy was working well in the 50s, 60s and 70s. I'm, I think I'm, I'm starting to sound a bit like an oldies goldies disc jockey, you know, the greatest economic policies of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, which was when we had very low unemployment and rapid economic growth and rising wages and expanding social programs. Uh, and it was a uniquely inclusive and prosperous era in capitalism. Uh, but we ended up having some problems uh, in the course of it all, uh, including um, inflation uh, at the end of it with energy price shocks, uh, profits that were declining uh, on, on in the business sector, uh, you had, on, in a global uh, view, national liberation movements in Africa and Asia, 
uh, that were um, uh, uh, changing the uh, government and politics of former colonies and in a way uh, eating away at the uh, global dominance of uh, capitalism uh, at that time. So in response to all that, uh, you had a change in direction. The elites of the world uh, got together, the business elites and economic elites and political elites, and they actually did get together. Okay, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Okay, I'm going to point this out. I'm not saying it was all a conspiracy, but they did get together in groups like the Bilateral Commission. Uh, they met uh, in, a, in, a, in a castle in France uh, in a group called the Mont Pelerin Society and talked about, you know, in the 70s, we don't like the way this ship is headed. Let's find a way to turn it around. Uh, and uh, they did. They, invent, they developed a whole set of uh, tough love, harsh policies that kind of got back to the basics. Uh, of uh, capitalism. I'll stress, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I, I will say one thing that I've learned. Just because you're paranoid, okay, it doesn't mean they're not following you, okay? So just keep that in mind uh, as we talk about the Mont Pelerin Society and everything that unfolded uh, from that. Uh, they clear signs that we we're in a new era uh, in the economic world. We had uh, something called the Volcker Shock, the Volcker shock is uh, when interest rates were increased dramatically in the United States in the early 1980s. Uh, in order to bring inflation down, it caused a recession. Uh, Paul Volcker was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. at that time, and he, he oversaw this. Uh, and it was a sign that we were abandoning full employment as the goal of macroeconomic policy uh, at that stage. Then in the world of politics, he saw the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979, the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. The Volcker shock happened in 1978. So it was around the, 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 uh, around the end of the 70s that this whole uh, change in direction uh, occurred. Um, in terms of thinking about neoliberalism, uh, it is not a question of uh, shrinking the state, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's often described as getting government out of the way and downsizing uh, the state and letting business do its thing. Um, in fact, uh, in general, the state hasn't gotten smaller under neoliberalism. Uh, the state is is still large, and obviously in the last year with the COVID pandemic and so on, larger than ever. Um, it's more a question of what the state does. Uh, so we've had a situation where the state is uh, redirecting uh, policy uh, and its power to uh, more consciously and deliberately support the business community uh, as um uh, as the economy develops. Um, in the textbook on page 49, for those that have it, I've listed the uh, kind of um, main goals, I would say, of neoliberalism, uh, controlling inflation, protecting financial wealth, uh, imposing more discipline in labor markets, uh, refocusing government to meet business needs, um, generally restoring the dominance of business over our lives. Uh, and uh, in a way, the most uh, important one and the one where they've been most successful, I would argue, is to claw back uh, expectations that, that people have about where the economy is going and what they can reasonably expect and demand from life. Um, and the idea that people will be resigned to insecurity. And uh, I see this with young people today who think they'll never get a permanent job with benefits. They think they'll spend their whole lives working from gig to gig. And, uh, and once that kind of resignation uh, gets built in, uh, in a way, the, you know, uh, the battle has been half won for, for those who want to um, uh, reinforce an economy in which uh, insecurity and inequality are the norms. Uh, the key tools that neoliberalism used uh, included uh, using interest rates uh, aggressively to um, control inflation and, uh, in fact, to deliberately recreate unemployment uh, as a way of controlling inflation. A lot of privatization and deregulation uh, went on, uh, scaling back social security programs. Um, in Canada, uh, for example, we, we really dramatically cut the uh, former unemployment insurance uh, system. Instead, we ended up with employment insurance. Uh, provincial welfare programs in particular were also uh, paired uh, to, to very, very minimal sort of starvation levels especially for uh, people of working age. The idea there is uh, to create a situation where people are, are very insecure and sort of financially compelled uh, to work, um, even for low, low wages. Um, the attacks on uh, labor market regulations, including trade unions, uh, free trade agreements uh, used to expand uh, markets and um, uh, impose uh, that sort of business discipline on, uh, on countries through the international dimension. And we'll talk 
uh, about that in a later uh, a later lecture as well. Um, I do want to stress, despite this uh, kind of dominance of a, a neoliberal sort of tough love vision of the economy, um, there's still choices to be made, uh, even within the, the the realm of a capitalist economy. And uh, even with that uh, overall global trend towards a tough love or gloves off version of capitalism, you can still see great varieties in capitalism among different types of uh, types of capitalism. Um, in my in my work, I've kind of identified four uh, stereotypes of capitalist uh, economies. Canada would fit largely into what I call the Anglo-Saxon model, and this would be uh, Britain and former colonies of Britain that adopted um, British uh, legal and ownership structures and uh, have similarly uh, business-oriented uh, economic uh, system. And this is the uh, of all of the modes of capitalism, this is the one where the inequalities between rich and poor are most uh, striking. Uh, continental capitalism would be the European uh, countries like France, Germany, Italy, uh, which have a, a, a different uh, approach that uh, has a larger role uh, for government, generally uh, higher taxes, uh, generally more regulation over business activity, including labor markets. The Asian model of capitalism, which was, say, pioneered in Japan and then uh, imitated in places like uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, uh, Thailand, and now China itself, of course, which is, you know, its own thing, hard to pin down, but uh, has very strong parts of the economy that are very capitalist. Um, here you have a, a focus on industrial development, industrial planning, technology and innovation. Um, and high levels of investment. Uh, then you could call it the Scandinavian or Nordic model of capitalism. Um, uh, countries obviously like Norway and Sweden, Finland, Iceland, Denmark, but some European countries very similar. Austria and Netherlands uh, are two continental countries that are in a way more similar to the Nordic countries. This is where you have uh, the most uh, equal, most extensive social program. Um, big emphasis on public services and very high taxes. Uh, also, the countries, as we talked last week, that have the highest happiness, according to uh, the various happiness uh, measures. So um, I think there's lots of opportunity, even within uh, the capitalist world that we live in today, uh, to think about choices to be made. And this is the main takeaway from this look at history, is uh, nothing is permanent, nothing is inevitable, nothing is natural. Uh, we have lots of choices to make, and we can absolutely demand and campaign for improvements uh, in the economy that make it um, more tolerable and uh, more fair and uh, more uh, sustainable. Um, I'm going to uh, just um, take a, a minute. Well, this is a chart that's on page 50 of the book that uh, sort of summarizes the uh, different uh, features of those four models, including the level of taxes, the level of regulation, the size of government, uh, the level of inequality, uh, and so on. So I'll invite you to uh, look at that uh, at leisure. Uh, let's just take a little minute. I'd like to hear from folks uh, ab about uh, how the economy changes over time. I've emphasized that the economy is changing uh, and has always been changing and will keep changing, uh, including the uh, wholesale uh, introduction of new systems uh, from slavery to feudalism to capitalism, but then changes within capitalism itself, including the initial post-war prosperous years, the 50s, 60s and 70s. Uh, the uh, onset of neoliberalism uh, since the 1980s and a kind of a tougher love uh, type of environment. Um, how do we think it's heading in the future? And so this is uh, one simple question here. Uh, let's do the, the same thing we tried last time. Use the Q&A, use the Q&A function on your screen and send out a short answer. Do you think the next generation will have a better standard of living than us? or a worse standard of living? And a very short answer, why? Why do you think that? Um, traditionally, we view economic evolution as being something that takes us to a better place, uh, obviously, because of our increasing knowledge, our increasing productivity, uh, our learning by doing. And so, of course, the material standard of living in the long run uh, of human beings seems to have improved. Uh, on the other hand, over the last generation, it's not clear that that, that traditional trajectory of progress has in fact been uh, maintained. Uh, so um, what do you think? Uh, it used to be taken for granted that your kids would be better off than you. 
And I don't know if people take that for granted uh, anymore or not. So just take a moment to uh, shout, shout that out in the uh, Q&A. And uh, I am going to just take a look here at uh, some of the ones that come in. Uh, so who's going to be, who says they're going to be better and who says they're going to be worse? Uh, we see worse, if only because of the cost of dealing with climate breakdown. So uh, that's a good point. The changing environmental context for our work is going to affect things. Uh, could be better, says, uh, says Daniel, uh, but only if the family has a solid uh, financial base. Uh, Corrine says worse given climate change, displacement of people crowding. Maureen says worse uh, because people are less focused on saving for the future. Uh, Jennifer says worse, housing is too expensive. Uh, John says worse, uh, erosion of social pride and uh, respect and standard of living. Anne says worse, uh, there was more job security uh, in previous years. Carolyn says worse, <laughs> exponential increase in the pace of change, technology, climate change. Uh, somebody said better, hooray. I'm glad there's at least one optimist out there. Youth will be important in caring about their communities and the environment. That's a great one because we're optimistic, but we're not optimistic because of something that automatically happens in the economy. We're optimistic because we believe that future citizens and young people will, um, uh, will be able to do something about it. Uh, so I like that optimism. Uh, so uh, worse corporate greed, worse climate change, a lot of uh, concern about climate with good reason. Worse, uh, fewer opportunities and government moving to the right. Um, possibly better, says Anne. The people will live a simpler life with less stuff, but that might be better. Uh, good point, because the goal is not just to have more stuff. Uh, the goal is to have a higher quality of life, and that includes uh, leisure time. Uh, so lots of great answers there coming in from people. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going uh, We're going to save that, and I'm going to keep that as a bit of a poll. Uh, I do see that the worse are outnumbering the better by about a six to one margin. And that's not unrealistic. Uh, research suggests that in fact, this may be, the next generation may be uh, the first one in a long time where the economic conditions are actually worse than for their parents. And that shows that we're doing something wrong because we know how to work better. We've got more technology, more tools, more knowledge and uh, we know how to work better, so we should be able to live better. And if we're not, it's because we've somehow lost the plot. It, somehow we're running the economy, but not delivering the uh, benefits, the fruits of our labor uh, to make sure that we have better lives. Okay, uh, we have uh, just a few minutes left before we uh, take our little break, and I'm gonna do a, an equally fast um, tour. I'm gonna skip these two slides, we'll do that more next time. A very equally quick tour on the history of economics. I've argued that the economy has been changing and so has economics. It's a kind of a parallel track. Uh, economics is not a neutral science. Um, uh, we uh, cannot describe uh, human behavior like we describe how a billiard ball bounces off the pool table. Okay, uh, it's a social science and it's always incorporating values and ideologies. And someone who stands up and says, I'm a technical economist, I know what to do, uh, get them off the stage uh, because they will have their absolutely own values and ideologies, just like I do. I'm not, uh, I'm not at all um, denying that I have my perspective. You probably hinted, you probably got a hint or two about what my perspective uh, is, where, where we always have a stake as economists in um, not just explaining the economy, but what we think should be done to improve it. And economics responds to the problems that we see uh, emerging in the economy and in society. Uh, for example, there's a whole new field of economics now of environmental economics. Uh, we've seen the harm caused by pollution and degradation and exhaustion of natural resources. We've also seen the great passionate concern that people have about the future of the environment and what it's going to mean. And economists have responded. They don't, uh, they don't live in a vacuum. Um, in different ways. Some environmental economics is better than others, in my judgment, but at least we're on the case. And uh, that proves that economics is not set in stone. It is always changing uh, as well. I'm just going to run through very quickly uh, some of the key chapters in the history of economic theory. Um, the, the book I showed you earlier, The Age of the Economist, was all about this. And I really encourage you. In fact, I'll, I'll put that book and some others um, uh, on email are on the website, rather, uh, for those who would like to do some more reading about economic history. It's fascinating. The first uh, economists were called the classical economists, Adam Smith uh, in Britain, uh, David Ricardo, Thomas Malthus, uh, and others. 
Uh, they celebrated the emergence of this new form uh, of economy called capitalism. They thought capitalists were great. Unlike the landed gentry, they didn't just sit around and uh, consume the surplus. They reinvested it in new tools and, and technology. Um, they had a, a kind of pessimistic view about income distribution. They thought workers were just going to procreate uh, all uh, without limit uh, until they reached the point of starvation. So there was no point trying to lift living standards for workers. It was a horrible and historically wrong view. Um, and they believed that uh, ca the spread of capitalism, including globally, would be great. Uh, you had a reaction against the very harsh social uh, conditions of uh, early capitalism in the form of uh, Karl Marx and the early um, uh, revolutionary uh, economists and socialist e economists, uh, motivated by a concern with how uh, how cruel and uh, how much suffering was caused and by the inequality between the incredible surpluses that the owners of these new factories could harvest and the continued uh, hardship. Uh, Karl Marx had a view that uh, the system would collapse of its own accord, and this uh, was probably his biggest mistake uh, because of internal conflicts and instability. That has not happened. Uh, capitalism has proved itself uh, remarkably um, flexible and resilient and finding ways to address its own problems. So I don't think it will uh, collapse of its own accord, but uh, if it changes, it will probably change because people demanded something different. Uh, which is uh, a slightly different uh, vision. And, and he put his uh, theories into action as well by helping to found the uh, international uh, communist movement. Uh, then a reaction against Karl Marx and some of the other radical critiques, uh, including other kinds of socialist uh, uh, economics uh, that were out there in the, in the 19th century, was the rise of neoclassical economics. And this today is still the dominant approach uh, to economics that's taught in universities. Uh, part of their goal was purely ideological. Marx said that the profit harvested by the owners of early factories was exploitation. It was just a way of grabbing the surplus that others produced. The neoclassical economists had to confront that argument. And they came up with a whole theory to say, no, no, profit is not surplus. Profit is not exploitation. Profit, they said, is a return to the productivity of capital. That was uh, a core goal of uh, the theory for uh, neoclassical economists, including Leon Walras, uh, uh, Alfred Marshall, uh, Jevons, and others uh, in the late 19th century. And they developed an idealized vision of how a market economy would work based on individual interaction, uh, supply and demand, and came up with a very... Um, in a way, unrealistic theory about how society is best off when markets are allowed to operate without interference or regulation or control from government. Um, and it, it, it is not really an empirical theory, it's more uh, an idea. Uh, it's called axiomatic reasoning, where uh, people in neoclassical theory started with certain assumptions, including assumptions that are completely unrealistic, like perfect competition and perfect knowledge. And if those assumptions were true, then you could have a perfect market economy, uh, which is, you know, kind of an exercise in intellectual curiosity, but doesn't really describe the uh, world that we live in. Nevertheless, in part for political reasons, it came to dominate uh, conventional economics. Uh, by the 1930s, it was pretty hard to believe that markets were perfect and always, uh, always right. So uh, you had the depression, mass unemployment, uh, uh, political challenges to the rule of capitalism. And uh, Keynes came along, Keynes in the 1930s in Britain, to explain why that happened uh, and developed a, a theory about why neoclassical economics was wrong, that uh, markets would not always uh, operate uh, effectively, supply would not always equal demand, and unemployment could exist, including for long periods of time. Uh, and this was uh, where uh, Keynesian economics came from, which advocates government intervention, including big injections of government spending to offset uh, recessions. The New Deal in the 1930s was based on Keynesian ideas. Much of what the government has done in Canada during the COVID uh, crisis is based on Keynesian ideas as well. That is to put purchasing power into the economy and um, uh, stop depression. Uh, we would have had a depression, no doubt about it, uh, without the huge amounts of uh, income support and other spending that government undertook in the uh, COVID crisis. In the long run, Keynes viewed, uh, he famously said, in the long run, we're all dead. But he also thought in the long run, uh, we would have to have social ownership, public ownership of investment as a way of keeping the economy going. Um, for a while, Keynesianism was tolerated within neoclassical theory until about the 1970s. And then 
I mentioned the advent of neoliberalism and the change in capitalism in the late 70s, uh, and that was paralleled by a change in economics. And so we had a kind of a revitalization of a sort of fundamentalist uh, kind of neoclassical theory uh, that, that uh, critiqued Keynesianism and said, no, we got to get back to basics in terms of getting um, uh, government uh, uh, regulation out of the way and um, letting markets do their thing. Milton Friedman, of course, was the most famous uh, of these kind of fundamentalist uh, economists. He was part of that group at the Mont Pelerin Society that uh, plotted neoliberalism, and he worked very closely with the dictatorship in Chile. After 1973, uh, the right-wing dictator uh, Pinochet came in in Chile and implemented many of Friedman's ideas. It was kind of a test case. They were guinea pigs uh, for ideas that were later applied uh, elsewhere. Uh, in neoliberalism. Uh, today, there's still lots of debates uh, that go on. Um, uh, I have uh, here listed a number of the critics of neoclassical economics, uh, different schools of thought that challenge neoclassical theory on different grounds, some of them in a Keynesian tradition, some of them in a Marxist tradition, and other, uh, other ideas, including environmental economists, feminist uh, economists who highlight the failure of traditional economics to uh, understand gender divisions uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, lots of debate still going on. And uh, again, as in the economy itself, economics is something that uh, isn't static, isn't permanent, uh, isn't, uh, isn't natural. Um, there's no objective truth. Uh, I am always, uh, I always love this quote from Joan Robinson, who was a famous Keynesian economist in uh, England, uh, who said, the purpose of studying economics is to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. Uh, so that's where we have to go in with our eyes open and understand the biases that are inherent in economics, understand the, the historical evolution of uh, economics, and have confidence that uh, by continuing to debate and research and argue, um, we're going to end up uh, with a, a better, uh, more accurate, and more helpful uh, economics. Uh,